Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 12th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. Also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what we learned as a result of preparing for and following up after our testimony last Saturday before the House Ways and Means Committee. Second, our concern as some start proposing ways to spend Alaska's share of the Federal American Rescue Plan funds. And third, some good oil news from the North Slope, but the same big question lingers. And now, let's join Michael. So let's talk a little bit here about uh, your... Um your prep here and what you've discovered on the fiscal solutions that are facing the state, all the vi- viable options and available options that are there. What, um, you know, what, what, what have you seen and what have you learned and what are the, what are the impacts of what's going on? So I was invited to testify before house ways and means on Saturday. Um, uh, Carl Davis from ITEP and I were invited to testify uh, and the and the subject was the economic impact of various fiscal solutions. Um, and it's not so much the the testimony itself where I learn, although uh, the, the questions uh, during uh, follow, in the course of the testimony are always interesting. But it's the prep before where you know you talk to people and ask uh, what subjects they anticipate or they they would like to see covered, and then the follow up after uh, asking them what. Uh, what they thought of the of the of the testimony and the and the subject matter that that's always where I learn uh, around these around these instances and and maybe it was stuff that uh, maybe it's stuff that's just common sense and and uh, and I knew before but it, it certainly got reinforced um, uh, with uh, with this uh, this piece of testimony it, the, the 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 thing that that came through is that people don't really dispute. Uh, that cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy and Alaska families. In fact, uh, during the course of the testimony, um, uh, Chair Sponholtz repeated uh, herself repeated several of the of the themes that we've talked about uh, over the last five years. Themes that we've talked about uh, on the show with you. Um, and and generally speaking, uh, I don't think there was there was hardly any dispute. About about that subject from from the broad range of people I talked to before um, and after. So you would think, okay, everybody understands that PFT cuts have the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy and Alaska families. Let's do something about it. That's where that's where the the, the car goes off the road. There's there's so much disagreement, such a wide gap uh, between. Uh, what people think we ought to do uh, uh, as a result of PFD cuts being uh, to, to, to stop the impact of PFD cuts. I mean, you, you, you go all the way from those who still believe in cuts only, that, that we're going to hold our breath until, you know, until government spending is cut down to traditional revenues, and that's the way to solve the problem all the way to the other extreme of, uh, of, of uh, people holding their breath and saying we're going to have a progressive income tax. The, the, way, to, the way to fill the revenue gap is, uh, or the fiscal gap is, uh, is, is, a, um, uh, is a progressive income tax. 
and and there's very little movement um, in 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 what I found uh, toward the middle. Uh, I mean, occasionally you'll get people uh, that talk about progressive income tax saying, you know, they might agree to uh, other solutions to fill the fiscal gap, but they're certainly not going to agree to cut. Occasionally you'll hear people at the other end, uh, at the cut end, saying uh, uh, they might agree uh, under a, a variety of circumstances to uh, to some uh, revenue solution, solution, but those, you know, those uh, commitments are, you know, constitutionalize the PFD and, and constitutionalize a, a spending cap and, you know, institute Governor Dunleavy's uh, uh, no taxes without vote of the people. Um, it, things that will never be agreed, that, that, won't, that aren't being agreed to by the other side. And so the default that, that we've fallen into uh, that we continue to fall into, and that we will con- that we will continue to fall into, uh, is is PFD cuts. The thing that have the very thing that that I I would suspect there's there's near universal agreement on the very thing that has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and the Alaska economy. That's just the default, and and the failure to push to agree to come together to to look for. Uh, alternatives is is um, or the, the the desire to do that just isn't there, uh, and and I don't think it's going to be there. Uh, I, I, the depressing thing out of this out of the testimony is is I don't think uh, it's going to be there uh, this legislative session. Um, Chair Sponholtz uh, uh, views the Ways and Means Committee as a as a two session. Uh, or two uh, yeah, two session uh, uh, effort uh, both this year and or two year effort both this year and next year uh, with hearings in, over the interim not really coming to uh, propose legislation or actual you know a, a actual way forward uh, uh, until sometime uh, next year which is an election year which means you know it, it's not going to go any place in that year so I think I think that I mean the 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 the, the takeaway I got from all this was, yep, we absolutely agree with you. Largest adverse impact, worst thing we possibly could be doing, hardest uh, hardest uh, uh, impact on Alaska families, uh, hardest impact on the overall economy. Uh, but nope, we're not going to do anything different. <laughs> we're just going to keep on going down that road. And so this is, an, this is something that's uh, been echoed um, by uh, I think both Mike Shower and Pete Machicki, who have been on the program multiple times, by Kathy Tilton, who's been on the program, where they're basically saying it just looks like there is no political will to fix the problem. I mean, am I summating this whole thing properly, Brad? That there may be a few individuals in there who want it, but overall, especially with those in power and those that, that are basically holding the reins, there is no political will to fix the issue. So I would put it slightly differently, I guess. I, I would put it there's a lot of political will to fix the issue our way. <laughs> there, there is no political will to find a compromise. Uh, there, is no, there is no effort to you know, come together and say, oh, God, this is the worst way. You know, the, the, the way we've been going is the worst way. We can, we can at least find a lesser, uh, a lesser harmful way uh, to do this. Um, and, and, and compromise. Everybody, not, not everybody, but, but almost all, let me try it that way, are sort of locked into their solution is the solution, um, and, and the other guy's solution is not the solution, and, and we're not going to push to find uh, an, an alternative uh, compromise that might be a better solution not not the perfect solution from our standpoint, but a better solution than continuing to go down this road that has that has the largest adverse impact. Uh, I mean, for a long time, I've thought that, that the flat tax uh, that I've talked about on the show and I've taken so much grief over, uh, I thought that is that would be the uh, the compromise solution because it, it 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 treats all income brackets the same. It doesn't it doesn't push the costs. To middle and lower income Alaska families, it doesn't push the cost to upper income families. All families have skin in the game, and I and I argue it has a it has the positive benefits of 
uh, on uh, on spending by having everybody engaged so that everybody is concerned about about spending that additional dime because everybody would have to contribute uh, to to that additional dime. Uh, but there there really is no will. I mean, where where the lack of political will is is finding that compromise. Right. Everybody, everybody's got a lot of will behind. Yep. My my way is the high, my way is the highway, um, and uh, and and if we go down this road, we've got it solved, and 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 it's, but but there's just no political will to to find a compromise, and so we end up, we end up continuing to use what what I don't I didn't get any pushback on the concept that PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on Alaska families in the overall Alaska economy. None. I mean, Natasha might. She wasn't. She wasn't there. She might, maybe. Uh, although I haven't even heard her really push back on that. No pushback <laughs> on that. It's just that we're not going to agree to a compromise, so we could have to continue to go down. The well, road. it's kind of like inertia, right? I mean, it's kind of like this is the way we've always done it, so that's the way we're going to do it. And so, I mean, it's horrible and it's bad, but you know, it's what we know. So we're just going to keep doing it because we can't come to a. We can't come to a compromise, but it really, it, Brad. I mean, can I be devil's advocate here for a second and say, you know, there is compromise has almost become a dirty word, and in part, it's because it seems like in many ways across the country, and maybe this is just anecdotal, or maybe this is just perception, but it seems like those on the more conservative side have been willing in the past to do some compromising, and everybody talks about compromising. And then the the more progressive side says, yes, compromise. And then they kind of stick it to everybody, and they don't really compromise. But the and the, at some point, the conservatives are like, look, if we're going to comp, we want a real compromise. We you know, but but for you, code is compromise is we do it your way and we like it kind of thing. And and I think that's kind of the feeling of many conservatives out there is that you know we'd be open to a true compromise, but not a compromise in name only kind of thing. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I get that reaction from both sides, frankly. Um, I mean, Chair Sponholtz has proposed a spending cap. Uh, she and Bryce Edgman have put in a bill that we've talked about on the show before uh, that is a spending cap. And to them, that is that is a, a compromise in the sense that um, uh, they're proposing to cap government growth. And, and she's actually you know, turned into an advocate of it. Uh, uh, talking about some of the excesses that occurred uh, in the in the early 2010s uh, as examples of you know spending that, that she would like to see curtailed. So, I mean, from it, when you when you have a, a conversation on that side, is hey, we've proposed uh, spending caps, but but you know, sort of the these guys on the other side, they they just they they don't they want to they don't want to come to the middle. I um and and, and certainly conservatives have the same. Uh, have the same perspective on on uh, on, on things they proposed. I just I, it, it was it was. It, it, I think there's a deal there. I mean, sort of the sad thing out of this is I think there's a deal there, and I think the deal is a spending cap with uh, constitutionalization of the PFD, which you know, in conversations, I don't find anybody except Natasha. I don't find anybody really. You know, digging their heels in over and saying, "No, we're not going to do that," um, uh, and and you know, and and a and a level, uh, whether or not it's a flat tax, but a level uh, a revenue uh, measure to to close the gap. Because even even with Governor Dunleavy's uh, spending cap uh, uh, and and spending cuts that he's proposed. Uh, we still have a fiscal gap. We still have right. a, about a billion dollars. Well, fiscal gap. and the problem with people like Ivy Sponholtz clinging to her ideal of her spending cap is that it's ineffectual. We know that it's going to be ineffectual, but I mean, and you could cling to it and say, "Oh, look, you know," she can cling to it and say, "Look, I'm I'm standing for all," but we know that it really is not going to do anything. And and if we could get the constitution uh, or the PFD constitutionalized. It would be in effect a de facto spending cap as well, because it would take that off the table and it would no longer be under their control, which would be a good thing. So, I mean, I guess I would take her spending cap along with a constitutionalized PFD, because at least one of them would hold back on the number on the amount of spending in the state of Alaska. Yeah, I think that's. I think well, I mean, the other piece of of what 
she would want to see or others would want to see is, you know, revenues. What are you, how are you going to close the fiscal gap? I mean, we're never going to get a constitutionalized PFD alone, standing standing alone, because because those who are concerned about government spending want to maintain government spending levels. Are, see that as the trap, right? They right. see, you know, taking away the PFD, no agreement on other revenues, uh, and so all of a sudden, you know, you're sitting there with a with a gap that can't that, that that there's no agreement on how to fill. So they're never going to agree to constitutionalize the PFD until there's agreement on how you on how you close that gap. So the the third part of this ha- would have to be, uh, you know, what's the what's the what's the revenue side are going to be? What do you what what's the what's the agreement going to be? On revenues, and and when I talk to when I talk to conservatives, I think there, I, I think there would, I think we could come to an agreement uh, on on what uh, what those revenues could be in the context of a spending gap or spending cap and and constitutionalizing the uh, the PFD. I, there's just, I mean, what what you're articulating, Michael, is is a lack of of of, of a concern about you know the the good faith of the of the of, of people on the progressive side to, you know, to, to live up to the to the deal of, of a spending cap, you got the same thing on the progressive side. They 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 don't believe they they have a, a concern about the willingness of conservatives to agree to uh, to live up to an agreement on revenues, and so you just right. sort of sit there in this no man's land. This divisiveness, of course, continues at all levels of government, and that's part of the problem. Uh, we're coming up on the and, go ahead. And, and 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 the damn thing about it, the thing that's just so frustrating to me, is all of that leads to continue to use, continuing to use what I think both sides recognize is the is the tool that has the largest adverse impact on the economy. Everybody talks about wanting to save the economy, uh, but but we use the tool that has the largest. We end up using the tool that has the largest adverse impact on the economy. Right. Exactly. You know, I think what you're pointing out here, and this is just my take on it, uh, I think you're pointing out or or highlighting, you know, again, kind of this divided nature that we have in this country right now, that we just cannot find the middle ground between the sides. And uh, there are those of us who are, you know, libertarians or more moderate, either moderate conservatives or moderate uh, progressives, who are in the middle going, guys, guys, can't we just come somewhere in the middle here and, and do this thing and talk about it? And it just seems like the the opposite sides are so divided, like you said, they can't even trust each other to find some kind of compromise. And I don't know what the solution is to that. And, and that's that, it's troubling me because, I mean, I would I want to hire I want to hire and, and elect more conservative people to have smaller, more limited government. But I don't know if that's adding to the problem or if the answer is to bring somebody into the middle. I don't know. I, I just at this point, what we've got going on is just not working, and I don't know how to fix it. Yeah, I think I think what we have to recognize, both nationally and at the state level, is we're divided. We're no one is. We're not going to leg wrestle and some and one side be able to slam the other. That 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 the that the votes are divided in a way that no one side can control the other, um, and that we have to find if if we're gonna if, if we're not gonna be, de- you know, continually defaulting to these worst options, we have to find some way to 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 reach across that divide and find uh, and find solutions that aren't the worst option that are that are less than the worst uh, option. And that takes trust. I mean, you were you were just articulating the the concern about well, the progressives will never live up to their bargain about, you know, a real spending cap. The progressives uh, have the concern that the that the conservatives will never live up to their bargain about uh, about uh, filling revenues. Even if we agree on what the spending cap would be, they'll never live up to their to their end of the deal on uh, on filling those with uh, uh, with revenues. And 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 this lack of trust just um, uh, just just you know, results in in the continual default to the to, to the worst outcome. I you have to find some way to bridge the trust. I mean, I've spent a lot of time with uh, with groups that are doing that at a national level. Uh, uh, Braver Angels, which is a group that you know, is is equally divided between conservatives and and what they call reds and blues, equally divided between the two, uh, fi- trying to find ways to, to to build common ground. There's a Problem Solvers Caucus at the national level. 
backed up by a group called No Labels that that are trying is trying to find uh, uh, equally equally divided problem solvers caucus is a Congress in the there is a caucus in the U.S. House that's equally Republicans and equally Democrats trying to find uh, a solution so that we don't keep defaulting to the to the uh, to the to the worst option. It, it takes trust. I mean, it takes trust. It takes trust that the other side is going to live up uh, to to their end of the bargain. Both sides have stories about how the other side didn't live up to it the last time we did this, um, and uh, and and it's just. I mean, it's. It takes trust to trust to get over that, and try and you know the theory behind braver angels um, and the theory behind the problem solvers caucus is building personal relationships, and those personal relationships build trust. Uh, but y- 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 that may be true for the legislators, but but the experience you sort of find is well, they still have constituents who don't have trust, and who you know go on rampages if. Uh, if if they if they feel their legislator is compromising with the other side because the constituents don't have trust uh, in the other side, and 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 the and the and I can live with all that. That's okay. I mean, everybody just doesn't trust everybody else. But the problem here, the problem in Alaska, the problem in this situation, is we're defaulting to the worst outcome. We're defaulting to the outcome that that I think uniformly now people agree as the as the largest adverse cost on the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy on, and on Alaska families. Right. And it's just frustrating that you can't say, okay, well, let's, let's just try to get, you know, not the largest, ad, let, let's just try to find the next largest impact. <laughs> let's just move back from this a little bit. Can we pull the other lever um, at least a little bit? Just pull the other lever a little bit just to, you know, yeah. to take some pressure. Off. We're into number two of the weekly top three. We're talking about the ARP, the American Recovery Program, and the CARES Act money. Um, and the effect that it's going to have on Alaska. We've, we've talked about this a little bit last week where we're, the fear is, of course, is that they'll see this as a windfall and it will basically stop any discussion into the size and scope of government or restricting government spending, uh, but that it's a short-term fix, that even if it, it backfills for a year or maybe even two, we're still looking at a 10-year deficit plan as it goes out. Uh, Brad's got some thoughts on this. Uh, it could be the... You know, it could be the quasi oil strike type thing where you're going to see the money's come back. But, uh, uh, Brad, you've got some thoughts on this. Well, I, I think I think I'm beginning to have concern that it is the is, is like an oil boom again. It is the equivalent of oil going to a hundred dollars, and everybody's saying not only saying, uh, "Oh, uh, we don't have to worry about that fiscal situation anymore because oil's gone to a hundred dollars." Not only that, but hey, where are we going to spend all this money? Um, and, and I'm beginning to have a concern, um, well, more than beginning, I'm deepening a concern, uh, that, that that's the, that's the, that's sort of the, the road we're going down. You're beginning to see small things, uh, about people proposing, uh, what they're going to do with, uh, with this money. Governor Dunleavy, uh, had a press conference where he talked about, you know, we're going to have a tourism, uh, we're going to, we're going to give support to, uh, all the industries that have been hit by tourism, and we're going to, you know, have a, a tourism ad campaign funded by funded by the state, uh, like nobody's seen before. Well, what he's talking about using is, or what he's talking about is using uh, ARP money to uh, uh, to fund a campaign like that. That's not something the state has done before. Um, it's not backfilling a spending program. Uh, that we that we already have that's been that's that's been underfunded because of because of revenue or low revenues. Uh, we're talking about creating an entirely new program uh, uh, on top of existing programs uh, and funding that. I I understand why you want to do that. Our tourism industry has been hit hard. We do want people uh, coming to Alaska, but I'm not sure I'm not sure it's the lack of demand. To come to Alaska, that, that's the problem, the lack of advertising about how great Alaska is. I think it's just been, you know, people don't want to travel, didn't want to travel, couldn't travel, were prevented from traveling, uh, and so and so didn't come up. Ships can't come, and so, and so you can't come up. I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I don't think we have to generate new demand that, 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 that has fallen off. I think it's, I think it's just getting things open back up so people can make the trip. But nonetheless, the governor wants to show that he's concerned about it and, and go on, uh, spend this. That's a small thing, uh, but but we're beginning to see uh, 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 things like that uh, show up in the 
uh, and show up in, in other places. There was a Jake Metcalf, who's uh, uh, the head of one of the uh, government unions, uh, had an editorial column, uh, an op-ed that talks about all the wonderful things that we're going to be able to do with uh, with the ARP money. Um, you know, people at the University of Alaska are talking about you know being able to to refund uh, the University of Alaska, and there's there's an article out there about how you know we're going to be hurt because we've had these seventy million dollars in in cuts to the University of Alaska that result in. Uh, you know, may result in losing uh, federal money, and so we need to we need to restore those spending cuts. We need to, you know, re-up state spending to to the University of Alaska in order to get all this additional federal money. Sort of the trap we fell in with Medicaid over the years, right? Right, you know, right. Uh, if we just have this additional Medicaid program, this additional state spending, we get all this additional federal money. Where I, you, you're just seeing, you're beginning to see sort of like spring. You're beginning to see these sprouts of all these wonderful ideas people can can do with this money. And, and my point has been, and I'll continue to make, we need to view these in the same way that we view uh, that we view state spending. Yes, we're using state; we're, these will be filled by federal dollars, but we need to view it in the same way as we view state spending. Because every federal dollar you spend this way, you're not going to be able to use to backfill state spending. Um, and if you don't backfill state spending, you're still going to have to. Uh, you're still going to have to use, you know, come up with state revenues to fund that state spending that uh, that you're not backfilling, and that'll lead to PFD cuts. So ultimately, every dollar you spend on a new program, every federal dollar you spend on a new federal program is going to come out of the PFD, not immediately, right. but, but in the but, long run, but right. over time. Well, and you, you pointed and, that out. Yeah, you pointed that out with the Medicaid thing where, oh, no, we need this. This is free money right now. The Fed's going to pick up all it. And then the next thing you know, our health and social services budget balloons up by six, seven, eight hundred million dollars because all of a sudden the Fed stopped paying for a big chunk of it and we've created the programs and now we're on the hook for it. That's always the Yeah, exactly right. And and, and we create these programs. I mean, I'm not saying this is what's gonna happen, but let's just for an example, Governor Dunleavy, we go forward with this this you know, this advertising program like you've never seen for Alaska. Uh, uh, using federal money, and then you know the federal money runs out, and and the 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 tourism industry says, hey, wait, we need to continue this program because it's had these great results uh, of bringing people up to Alaska. Well, we, it had the great results of bringing people up to Alaska because Alaska was open again, the co- the the country was open again, Canada was open again. We were able to bring people up here. That's what really drove it. But oh no. We'll we'll see people saying, oh no, this great this had great advertising program. So so we need to continue. Um, and and you know we'll see the same thing with the university. So it's it's we we, we, we just like hundred dollar oil. Just think about this like hundred dollar oil. Just like hundred dollar oil. Uh, when as we use this money, when we create programs, when we create you know spending expectations, when we create constituencies around spending programs. We're just we're just sinking our boat further uh, once once you know the ARP money goes away or, or the the analogy once oil goes back to fifty dollars we're just we're just we're just taking on more even more uh, problems uh, on the other side of this and and I understand the I understand the immediate reaction of oh we got all this money what are we going to do with it you know how can I show my constituents that I that that, that they got the benefit of it um, well I hopefully. Uh, uh, people will uh, people will will, uh, will will keep themselves reined in, but that's a hope. That's an aspiration. That's not a right. that's not a given. Yeah, well, I mean, at this point, I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not heartened by what I'm seeing coming out of Juno and the commentary that I've read so far from legislators on this money. They're not, you know, I don't think they're planning on using it as a way to ease down or glide slope the problem down. They're not. It just. It doesn't seem like anybody is thinking in a ten-year cycle. Um, you know, n- nobody's really thinking about that. It's like, oh, we've avoided it. We can. We can look at it next year. That seems to be the general. The general modification is that. Well, oh, this. This gives us till next year now to look at this. Yeah, there. There. This does show up in one place that I think is important. Yeah, you know, the Senate is now considering. Uh, the emergency uh, powers bill, right? And they've included in the rewrite that came out yesterday limitations on the governor's ability to direct this billion dollars or billion plus dollars that's coming to the state. That that he has to, 
requiring that the governor come through the appropriation process. I think that's a good step. I think requiring the governor to come through the appropriations process um, is the legislative appropriations process um, is is a good step. I, it's more transparent. There's more constraints on it. Um, you, know, you, you have legislators who still want to spend the money in some other way, but but at least requiring more transparency, public transparency, transparency about what's going on, I think would be a good thing. But there's pushback on that. I mean, there's pushback right. on people saying, "Oh no, we don't we don't need to do that." Less than a minute here, Brad. Um, the possibility of us having new revenues, new taxes come this session. What do you think? Uh, new revenues certainly with the, with the federal money. Uh, New tax or new taxes or new revenues in the sense of taxes? No, uh, it's just not going to happen this session. Not enough. Uh, they can't even come together enough on that. Maybe next session we'll be looking at something like that. Brad Keithley. Maybe I, you, you have to you have to build trust. You have to you have to get people that are sober about this. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, we're going to have to get through the the ARP money first. Yeah. Well, that and that's the thing, isn't that isn't that the crazy part? We got to get through all this free money first before we can get our fiscal house in order. There's just something wrong with that whole statement. But isn't that a crazy statement? We've got to get through all this free money before we bring our fiscal house in order. Right, Brad? I mean, we've gotten this windfall, and we'll, we'll, we'll take care of our fiscal house as soon as we get through burning through all this windfall. That's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of the reaction. People don't want to make hard decisions. And, you know, any excuse you can have to avoid making a hard decision, uh, uh, you, some people take. And... You know, because of because of this because of this divide in the state, uh, if you make a hard decision about either about spending cuts or about about revenues to fill the fiscal gap, uh, you're going to have people mad. And so, you know, <laughs> yes, I mean, one attitude up that, that I that I found in Juneau is yes, we lost John Coghill. Yes, we lost Jennifer Johnson. Yes, we lost people uh, who uh, who you know. We're, we're advocates of PFD cuts, advocates of using PFD revenues as the way of closing the fiscal gap. Uh, yes, there was pushback on that, but that was only in some districts. Um, you know, Natasha got reelected. Uh, the people in Southeast, uh, uh, the legislators in Southeast got reelected. Uh, Steve Thompson got reelected. Uh, uh, Bart LeBon got reelected. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to lose some people at the margins, but, you know, by and large, we just keep going down this road and, and, uh, and 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 enough of us get reelected, we just keep going down this road. And it's just, I, there's there there's there's without having trust between the two sides, without having trust saying yes, this is the the largest adverse impact. We got to do something about that. We've got to we've got to you know find a lesser impact. Uh, without trust between the two sides on finding a way to do that, we're not gonna we're not gonna get it done. We're just gonna keep going down the road of uh, of PFD cuts. You want to give us a brief uh, brief take on number three, which is the new oil discovery yep. on the North Slope. Yep. So there's a 88 Energy, which is a which is an Australian company uh, that has uh, uh, been active on the slope, bought uh, uh, bought uh, other companies' uh, positions, have have done some exploration. Uh, on the slope, uh, they had good results with a couple of wells uh, that they've drilled. Not not perfect results because they had some mechanical problems in the wells that that didn't enable them to finish the testing they wanted to do this year. Uh, but had good results uh, on on the slope. Uh, it looks like another extension of the of the play of the geologic formation that uh, Conoco's found uh, in in its Willow Prospect that uh, Pika's found or that. Uh, oil search and Armstrong have found in uh, in their Pika prospect. It looks like it's another element of that. Um, so, from a geologic standpoint, it's great news. And you know, if we were back in the 70s or 80s or 90s or 2000s or even the 2000, early 2010s, uh, it'd be really exciting news. But the same question uh, is is hanging over this that I think hangs over the Pika prospect, uh, and that is, are they going to be able to find financing? Uh, in uh, in this current time, so they're going to be able to find people who are going to put up capital, put up enough capital to be able to develop these projects. People who believe that these projects are going to, you know, fit in the cost curve of, of going forward are going to be able to compete with shale. Uh, are going to uh, are, are not going to be you know strung out and then ultimately killed by uh, environmental regulations or by climate uh, regulations. Uh, or by the decline of demand in the 
uh, demand for oil in the market. Uh, that's really – it's the, the, the test on the slope is no longer really can you find good oil. I mean, we're finding good oil. Uh, the test on the slope now is can you find financing? Can you find dollars uh, to bring these things, to develop these things and, and bring the oil to market? And that's, frankly, more of a challenge. It's going to be more of a challenge going forward in this market than, uh, than, than finding good oil. Um, and, and, and the financing is going to be the, is going to be the, you know, the ultimate, ultimate test. And I, I have concerns about that. I mean, I, you, 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 you read, uh, I read a lot of stuff about, uh, about the global oil market. I spent a lot of time, uh, writing, talking, uh, engaging with others about the global oil market and Alaska isn't even a footnote anymore. Uh, frankly, because it's just been written off as as one of those areas where uh, there's it's just going to be too difficult to develop, uh, too difficult to bring these things, uh, bring these projects to market. Too much risk. You're you're better spending your money, investing your money elsewhere in the world. Right. Uh, Brazil, Guyana, uh, 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 elsewhere in the world than you are. Uh, you, Putting your mind in Alaska, especially the, the, following the, especially following the lead of many major U.S. financial institutions, have all said they're not going right. to invest in the Arctic at all. Just the political right. the political football of oh hey we can't do that, uh, but they'll do it in Guyana. <laughs> they'll do it in Guyana. They'll do it somewhere else, but just not here. Yeah, it's the it, it's not it's not it, 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 it's political risk. I mean, I, I but it, it's just the financial risk. I mean, are, is there better places to put my money? Is there more secure places, better return? Uh, to put my money. So it, yeah. it, great news, great news in terms of the geologic prospects, but, but where you're going to hear me yelling and screaming and shooting off fireworks is is when these guys announce they've got them financed. Right. <laughs> they've got them backed up by yeah, dollars. Exactly. That's, that, that's what we need to be, that's what we need to be looking for. Uh, all right. Well, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board. I appreciate you uh, joining us as always. And, uh, Thanks for thanks for keeping us in the loop on your thoughts on this. We appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. I enjoy it. Yep, it's uh, always a good discussion, always, uh, always a good time uh, to see what goes on. Thank you, Brad. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.